All right. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the April History Cafe, Seattle's Sephardic Jews in the 20th Century. And thank you to all of those who are here in person and to those of you who are attending via the live stream. I'm Sora. I use they, them pronouns. I work here in Mohai in public programs. For low or no vision audience members, I am a white and East Asian person with shoulder length brown hair, wearing a white shirt and blue pants. <laughs> a few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, if you need a restroom, they're through the cafe and to the left at the end of that little hallway there. And we are so excited to present History Cafe in partnership with History Link, and it's on the third Wednesday of every month. Thank you to our regulars. We love having you. And thank you to all of those of you who are new to the program. A brief schedule of events. We'll start with a 45-minute talk, followed by 20 or 30 minutes of audience Q&A, and then there will be a book signing at the end. And tonight, we're going to be talking about, we'll be learning about immigration to this place and the formation of communities over time. And as part of that history, it's really important to recognize that people have lived here since time immemorial. And here at Mohai, we're on the historic and contemporary lands of the Suquamish, Duwamish, Muckleshoot, and all Coast Salish peoples. Historically, native communities were forcibly removed from the city, but today we honor their continued endurance with deep respect and gratitude for their unbroken stewardship of this place. We encourage you all to visit the websites of local tribes to learn more about whose land you're on, whether that's here in Seattle or from anywhere else on Turtle Island. Tonight's speaker is Devin E. Nahr, the Chair of Sephardic Studies and Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies at the University of Washington. He spearheaded the creation of the largest digital library of Sephardic texts in the country, a project highlighted in a new book, Sephardic Trajectories, Archives, Objects, and the Ottoman Jewish Past in the United States. His book, Jewish Salonika, Between the Ottoman Empire and Modern Greece, won a 2016 National Jewish Book Award. Without further ado, please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Sora, and to the Mohai team for the opportunity for, uh, for me to be here today and to share with you a little bit about the history of Seattle's Sephardic Jewish community. Um, let's see. I want to begin with a poem that I found in a Ladino Judeo Spanish newspaper in New York, which is called, you can see the English here, my translation. Me gusta Seattle, which means I like Seattle. 1931, during the Depression. Seattle es una ciudad hermosa, chica, ma bien valutosa. Tiene un clima agradable, una vista adorable, rodeada de rosas y flores, árboles de mil colores, lagos de todas las partes, la natura con sus artes. Es una ciudad cumplida, la cual alarga la vida, el paradiso sobre la tierra, con toda su rica materia. En el paradiso yo vivo, de ahí yo vos escribo, por escribir regularmente, cada semana exactamente. Albert Levy. Now, didn't you know that Seattle is paradise on earth? This guy came from New York. It's September, and I think that has to do with how he came up with his description of the city. If he came in, like, I don't know, January, February, he might have had something different to say about the city. But this is really remarkable in many ways because it is written by one of the most prominent Sephardic journalists and writers of the 20th century. He was from Salonika or Thessaloniki in Greece. Um, he was a journalist. He was a graduate of a rabbinical academy in Salonika. He had been a socialist, and he was the editor of New York's most important Ladino Judeo-Spanish Sephardic newspaper, La Vara, which means the staff or the stick. It was a satirical paper. And he was invited, given his prominence in the community and his knowledge of Judaism and Torah and Talmud, he was 
invited to become the director of the new Sephardic Talmud Torah, the new Sephardic religious school here in Seattle in the 1930s. And so this was shortly after his arrival and his first impressions of the beautiful city of Seattle. And indeed, Seattle has been a beautiful place and a place of welcome for many Sephardic Jews over the, uh, over the century since the, the first arrival. And Sephardic Jews have played an important role and have left their uh, imprint on many aspects of the city. Pike Place Market uh, is perhaps the most famous one in which quite a number of Sephardic Jews over the years have had important roles in the business and life of the uh, of the market, and you may be familiar with some of the other uh, uh, some of the other businesses in which Sephardic Jews have played a role, uh, Starbucks and um, Costco, as well as Benaroya Hall, which is the the name Benaroya is a Sephardic family as well. Now, the reality, however, is not as beautiful as this poem with which we began may have presented it, because for Sephardic Jews who came most immediately from the lands of the Ottoman Empire, uh, from the what was then known as the Orient, they encountered quite some uh, a range of difficulties and challenges upon their arrival in the United States and upon their arrival in Seattle. What I'd like to share with you is a story of both the successes and also the challenges, the efforts that Sephardic Jews engaged in to plant new roots here in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest. It is a dynamic story, it is a complex story, and it is a story in its historical roots that is, uh, brings with it a sense of ambivalence, I would say, in its origins. And I want to give you a little bit of an uh, introduction to that world today. And in order to do so, I want to go back in time a little bit 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. But that year also, the Jews were expelled from Spain, which was a very prominent Jewish community. And those Jewish communities dispersed across the Mediterranean world, and many of them settled in what was then the Ottoman Empire, the vast lands uh, marked here in yellow. It was a Muslim empire in which Jews received a, relative, uh, a relatively warm welcome. And they were able to develop their own communities and practice their religion for the next several hundred years. And to get a little bit deeper into those several hundred years, you can take a look at my book on Jewish Salonika uh, afterwards. I want to move forward, though, to thinking about how these communities were transplanted once again in the 20th century to places as far afield from the Ottoman Empire as Seattle here in the Pacific Northwest. A series of wars were among the precipitating factors that provoked Sephardic Jews in the Ottoman Empire to flee. And we have a decade of war that engulfs this region of the Eastern Mediterranean, what is today Greece and Turkey and the Balkans. And you can see here in this map, this used to be all part of one Empire and the different lines in purple and green represent how the region was divided into new national states and to um, some imperial holdings like the island of Rhodes, just off of the coast of uh, just off the coast of mainland Turkey here, which had also been part of the Ottoman Empire. It was incorporated into the Italian Empire in 1912, for example. And so this set of factors, uh, war and political transformation and rise as well as overriding economic transformations in the region led people to seek out new opportunities elsewhere. For Jews in particular, the political dimension was very significant. The Ottoman Empire had been a multicultural, multilinguistic, multireligious space, and the new nation states that were emerging were organized according to a different principle. One language, one people, one religion, one nation enclosed in a unified set of boundaries. So if you didn't belong to that dominant language group, you didn't belong to the dominant religion, you didn't share in that shared history, what were the possibilities for your participation in a shared future? So that, as for Jews and other marginalized peoples throughout Europe and beyond, became uh, motivation to leave. 
those who came to the United States, and they went not only to the United States, they went to France, they went to Latin America, they went to what was then Palestine, which had been part of the Ottoman Empire and then British, many different places, a far-flung flung diaspora, different parts of uh, even South Africa, and a variety of places. And they reestablished their cultural moorings in their new places of location. And um, here you see one of the early Ladino or Judeo-Spanish newspapers. And just a quick loss on Judeo-Spanish, which if you understood, does anybody know Spanish at all a little bit? If you know Spanish, maybe you understood a little bit as I was reciting the poem in the beginning. It's, it's quite similar, but it also involves historically being written in Hebrew letters. That's what you were looking at there, and that's what makes it Judeo-Spanish. Um, and they set up a rich uh, cultural scene in the United States that they transplanted from the Ottoman world. Now, what's fascinating here is the newspapers were all published in New York, but if you parachuted in from outer space and you picked up a Ladino newspaper published in New York in the 1910s or 1920s and you were looking through it, you would have sworn that Seattle were a borough of New York City because there was so much reportage and so much coverage about the activities of what was going on here in Seattle because by World War I, after New York City, Seattle became home to the second largest of the Ottoman origin Ladino-speaking Sephardic communities in the entire country. Today, it's considered third after Los Angeles. And you can even see the prominence is reflected here. Uh, a local leader of the Sephardic community was the representative of this newspaper, Chaim Leon, here in Seattle, Washington. And you can see some of the other locations across the United States and in the Americas where you could readily get access to the Ladino newspapers in New York City. The founders of the Sephardic community in Seattle, there are some wonderful legends about uh, how they arrived here in Seattle. And just to give you a quick sense of those stories is like for many of the other Sephardic communities in the United States, the origins of the Sephardic community in Seattle are intimately connected with Greek, the Greek community. And the Greek Sephardic Jewish community linkages are not only foundational to the Sephardic experience in Seattle, but also in places like Chicago, in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in Atlanta, Georgia, where Sephardic Jews followed their Greek friends from their hometowns and islands, coming to the United States. Now, in the case of Seattle, the story goes that um, when a Greek friend had returned back home um, to the Ottoman Empire, they told their Jewish friends about new opportunities that were available in the United States. And essentially, when you arrive at New York City, you take the train across the country. The Transcontinental Railroad had already been established. And before you fall off into the Pacific Ocean, you get out and there's a town that is burgeoning and it will have economic opportunities for you and that town is Seattle. And that became one of the main draws for, uh, for Jacques Polakar, Jack Polakar and uh, Salomon Calvo who had come uh, from the Ottoman Empire, from the island of Marmara, which is uh, not very far from Istanbul. Now that's sort of the uh, the legend in terms of the origin of the, of the Sephardic Jews in Seattle. And one of the other really important starting points to the story is captured in this lovely cartoon from a number of years ago when they sought to uh, make acquaintance of other Jews because they were sort of there alone. And the story goes that they went to the streets of Seattle and they uh, shouted, Yahudi, Yahudi, which means Jew, Jew, hoping that somebody would recognize what they were saying and come and support them. And that becomes the starting point of the connection between the Ottoman Sephardic Jews and the longer established Jewish communities who had been here since the 19th century. First, those coming from Central Europe and later the largest portion of the Jewish community in the United States, including in Seattle, Yiddish speaking Jews coming from Eastern Europe. And these new dynamics and intra-Jewish dynamics were in the early years marked by some tensions. There was a certain sense in Seattle and in many other places that the newcomers from the Ottoman Empire, 
it was impossible to imagine that they were Jewish by the American Jewish standards. They had different kinds of names. They came from different places. They spoke different languages. They had different pronunciation of Hebrew, different culture. Virtually everything was different about their um, uh, uh, about how they understand Jewishness, with the exception that they all called themselves Jews. Um, now, there's another angle that helps us explain how some of the early Sephardic Jews arrived in Seattle that is maybe less romantic than the Greek friends telling them to take the train across the country. And that has to do with the work and activities of an organization that was based in New York City. And that was called the Industrial Removal Office. Now, the, it has a very, what do you, it's a very unusual name, but um, what this organization was about, it was founded by the long-established German Jews in New York City, and what they were trying to do was actually trying to make more economic opportunities available to the Jews who were flooding the city of New York in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, they wanted to disperse the the intensely compact uh, neighborhoods or the ghettos as they were called the Lower East Side and uh, to try to reshape the image of American Jews. And so they removed, this was the language, they removed Jews from New York City to other places across the country, to Gary, Indiana, to Indianapolis, to Rochester, New York, to a variety of other places to sort of spread, spread them out and to provide them with other kinds of economic opportunities and living opportunities. And so looking at the records of the IRO, the Industrial Removal Office, which was established in 1901, and dealt principally with Eastern European Jews, you find that Jews from the Ottoman Empire are among them. And among those that were removed were quite a number of Sephardic Jews who had arrived in New York and are removed to Seattle. And here you can get a sense of some of their names and um, where they were living. LES is the Lower East Side. Most of them were on Christie Street, for those of you who might be familiar with New York. And you get a sense of some of their professions as they reported them to the IRO, and you see this, the years that were involved. And what's fascinating here is that one of the people who was removed through this process was Solomon Calvo, the same person who is indicated in the, uh, in the collective uh, memory of the community as the founder who had come in 1902. And he had come in 1902, but he had gone back. Many of the people who came to the United States went back. They went back because, well, maybe the U.S. wasn't all it was cut out to be. A lot of them went back to find brides. They wanted to get married, and so they went back. And what happened in Solomon Calvo's case is he went back, and he got married, and then he came back to New York. And he seems to have gotten involved with the IRO to help bring him back to Seattle. And so he had been moving in a variety of different directions, which was not uncommon at the time. Now... This is the first Sephardic woman to have come to Seattle, and she arrived in 1906, and her name was Dora Levy, later to be Dora Cohen. And um, when she arrived in 1906, there were 17 men, and she was the first woman in the Sephardic community. So imagine that must have been quite an experience at that time. What was also very interesting about uh, Dora, uh, Dora Cohen, whose uh, granddaughter, by the way, is with us, today, which is a wonderful honor, is that she was very, very well educated, which was unusual for the era and in a certain sense unusual for people coming out of her community. She was from Istanbul and she knew Ladino and French and German. She had picked up some Yiddish. She had gone to a missionary school and she really worked in a certain sense as a, as a translator, as an interpreter, all along the various legs of her journey to Seattle. And what you're looking at here is a photograph of which is uh, currently in my office, uh, if you want to smell, uh, if you want to get a sense of what the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul smelled like a hundred years ago, you can smell the rose water that is from the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul that family had sent to her through the Lower East Side in New York here to Seattle in 1906. And it's really one of the most remarkable artifacts we have from the Sephardic experience that links up the Grand Bazaar of Istanbul to the Lower East Side right here to Seattle, and you can smell the smells of a century ago uh, here, uh, halfway across the world here today. Um, 
Now, where did the Sephardic Jews settle when they arrived in Seattle? They settled principally in the area now known as the Central District, which was an area we'll speak about in a minute, where many different kinds of people found their home and where they established their roots. And what you see in the Ladino press are regular reports of what's going on in Seattle that are being sent back to New York and then published and distributed. I even found in this in New York Ladino newspapers uh, advertisements for shoe shine stands in Seattle, in the New York Ladino newspapers, because they would be sent back here to Seattle and they'd be sent to all of the different communities of Sephardic Jews. But this was sort of like the community voice. Um, was represented in the Ladino newspapers. And here is one of the early ones, La America, speaking about the location of the Sephardic Jewish settlement in 1912. So you can see here uh, Jackson, Main, and King Streets on the one hand, which was referred to as Jerusalem Town. And this was a place where Jews of all varieties were residing at the time. And um, 16th and Washington, and you can see the way that they're described here was it was not just all the Sephardic Jews sort of intermixed together, but there were clusters of people who came from particular places who settled with their own kind. And this was a typical immigrant settlement pattern of all different kinds. People settled with their landsmen, the people who came from their individual pit village or town or city or region, and the Sephardic Jews were no different from that. Um, and they also referred to themselves collectively as Turquinos. This was one of the Ladino words that they used to identify themselves as Sephardic Jews from the Ottoman Empire, like Turks. This is a sense of themselves as Turks. And even those who came from the island of Rhodes initially considered themselves part of this Ottoman Jewish community, even though the island of Rhodes in 1912 would become part of Italy and in 1947 part of Greece. One of my uh, PhD students, Oya Akhtash, did a really fascinating project looking at the U.S. Census in, um, uh, for Seattle. And she found that people coming from the Ottoman Empire were a wide variety of different um, populations. And you can see here um, all the different kinds of people who came from Turkey, which was the, how the colloquial way to refer to the Ottoman Empire at the time. Greek, Turkish... Syrian, Armenian, Albanian, Bulgarian, Arabic, probably means Arab, Macedonian, Assyrian. Now, there are a couple, you don't see Jewish, if you notice, and you don't see Sephardic in this space, but you do see Yiddish. Now, essentially, 0% of the Jews who came from the Ottoman Empire to Seattle spoke Yiddish as their native language, but what my, our supposition is, is that the census takers when they figured out that the people with whom they were interacting were Jewish, they just marked down Yiddish because that's Jewish is Yiddish and Yiddish is Jewish in the American context. Others went in a different way and that probably explains how do you have Spanish people coming from Turkey? Well, these are the Sephardic Jews and they were speaking Ladino, Judeo-Spanish. And so that probably explains why they are marked down as Spanish. So our inference is that those who are listed as Yiddish and those who are listed as Spanish were actually Sephardic Jews, but they were not readily identifiable by U.S. government officials, by the census takers. And this is even more fascinatingly revealed a few years later in the context of World War I, when all of the residents of the United States, whether you were a citizen or not, you had to sign up for uh, essentially the, the draft for selective service. And so we have some of these forms for people living in Seattle, Yuda Levi and Vitali Siva. And what's interesting here is for their race. For their race, it says Jew. It's interesting, this is self-reported. And at the time, this guy says Turk. So these were recognized at the time as racial categories. R categories related to race in this era in the United States were not necessarily or only about how you looked or the color of your skin. They were related to geography, they were related to culture, they were related to um, language that you spoke. And so this helps explain how these folks get categorized in the way that they do. But they're part of the same community. 
One is identified as a Turk, one is identified as a Jew. It gets even more interesting and strange in the next one. I don't know if you can see this, but this guy, Mr. Cohen, and this guy, Nassim Capaluto, anybody see what their race is identified? Mongolian. Say now, what is going on here? Mongolian. Why Mongolian? Because they were from Turkey. And Turkey was understood as part of Asia. And the racial category that was in vogue at the time, this was an era of eugenics, an era of race science, an era of now defunct racial theory, but it was all the rage at the time that shaped policy in every aspect of American society, from immigration and naturalization law to social policy, education, everything. Um, if you were not a eugenicist at the time, you were not with it. I mean, that, that if, you were not in, if you were not embracing race science, you were not up to date at the time. And so Mongolian was a way to say Asian. And it's fascinating. It was not related to necessarily how you looked, but it, in this case, it was where did you come from? And this will become very important in another moment, as I'll explain, because at this time, in order to become a citizen of the United States of America, you had to be a free white person. Or since the Civil War, of African nativity. And this, there were racial requirements to become a naturalized citizen of the United States until 1953. So if you were not white and you were not black, it was not easy to become a citizen. In fact, you couldn't become a citizen of the United States. And so being classified as Mongolian was actually a major liability because if you were to try then to apply for citizenship, you might be rejected on the grounds that you are not white or black, you are not European or African, you are Asian and therefore inadmissible to the citizenship of the United States. Yeah, Mongolian. Now, by 1920, after the war, apparently the US census takers figured things out a little bit better also having to do with the larger influx of Jews coming from the Ottoman Empire. And here you can see the blue dots are all the folks who are identified as Jewish. And again, this is from the research of my PhD student, Oya Akhtash. And you can see where they're congregating. Again, this is essentially the central district here. And what's also fascinating is we still have a variety of different people from the Ottoman Empire, from Turkey, residing in Seattle. But the overwhelming majority of those who were from Turkey were Jewish. So Jewishness and Turkishness in this context were very much uh, connected one to the other. And in the context of the World War, the First World War, and even before in the Balkan Wars, that was an additional liability. Um, the other reason that folks wound up in the Central District was because that was one of the places where they could live as Jews. And as some of you know, no doubt, there were many restrictive covenants all throughout um, Seattle um, from the 1920s through the 1960s. And you can see here a variety of places that excluded Hebrews, uh, meaning Jews, or a variety of other people. The most uh, perhaps provocative by our standards today would be Clyde Hill near Bellevue after World War II instituted a new restriction saying that only Aryans can live in that uh, region. This is after World War II, okay? So it gives you a little bit of a sense of, uh, of the dynamics of the time. Now, um, the Sephardic Jews who were uh, in Seattle at this, oh, sorry, one more example. This is 1941, the Blue, Blue Ridge Club, which is like in Ballard, it still exists today. When it was established in 1941, it had an exclusionary clause that is very unusual in the annals of exclusionary clauses. So it says, I'm not going to use this language, but no Asian, no black person, or any person born in the Turkish Empire, nor any lineal descendant of such person shall be eligible for membership in the club. Now, this is fascinating because this is 1941. There is no Turkish Empire in 1941. In fact, the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, had been dissolved about 20 years prior. And this club is still using the category of the Turkish Empire as a coded way to exclude people who came from that place and their descendants. So essentially it transformed birth in the Ottoman Empire into a 
a genealogical stain that was transmitted from generation to generation to generation. And that's very unusual and something that is special for, Se for Seattle in that context here. So again, this is the ambivalence. This is some of the challenges that were encountered in the early phases. But in the central district, Sephardic Jews nonetheless were able to develop a rich life for themselves. By World War I, uh, for example, many of the Sephardic Jews, as reported in the Ladino newspapers, were employed delivering fish to train companies, restaurants, and hotels. They were selling fruit. They were operating postcard stands. They were shining shoes. They were working in construction for ship companies. Young men would work two years or so, and they could accumulate about four or five hundred dollars. That would be enough to bring over brides from the Ottoman Empire, and some would become successful enough in their shoe shine, uh, shining shoes that they'd get their, their own stands, then they'd have their own um, shoe repair shops. And in fact, the Seattle Times ran an article about the first boot black union, and they called it the Greek boot black union. They couldn't understand, again, they were all Sephardic Jews, but again, that category was not well known, and many of the Sephardic Jews did speak Greek. That's why they were hanging out with the Greek guys in the first place. Now, the Central District also provides us with a very fascinating uh, uh, window into multicultural and relational dynamics between Sephardic Jews and other kinds of Jews and their neighbors. And one of the most interesting things that I found looking through the Ladino newspapers was that um, occasionally the Ladino newspapers in New York would list all of the subscribers to the newspaper in given locales. Seattle, after New York, again, Seattle has the largest numbers and uh, there were dozens and dozens and dozens of Sephardic households here in Seattle that were subscribing to the Ladino newspapers. Um, what was fascinating was I was looking through the press and I found one really interesting um, example, which, uh, which was a... a uh, the International Cafe was listed as a subscriber for the, um, for the Ladino newspaper La Vara in 1933. So I looked into what was the International Cafe, and I found this advertisement from 1934, which is approximately the same time. It was formerly the International Cafe, now known as Joe's Cafe. And what's fascinating is that the advertisement was in an African-American newspaper, and the owner was Japanese. And you could go to a Japanese-owned restaurant that you could read about in a black newspaper, and you could find Ladino newspapers, which suggests, again, a kind of space of connectivity and intersection in the central district, while each of the communities operated as their own communities. That's, I don't want to make it seem like everybody was like holding hands all the time and, and singing in the streets, although probably maybe they did that sometimes. There were shared spaces, and I think the cafe uh, gives us a sense of one of the possibilities. Another one is Washington Hall, and Washington Hall was a space that was used by all of the different immigrant groups and all of the communities in, uh, in Seattle, and Washington Hall became very important for the Sephardic Jewish community because this became a site where they would put on Ladino theater productions. And Seattle is also special insofar as after New York City, it was the only city in the United States that had a robust Ladino theater uh, production enterprise that lasted in the 1920s and 1930s and some echoes um, afterwards. And so you could go to Washington Hall and you could hear and you could see plays performed entirely in the Ladino language that catered to the Sephardic Jewish community with roots in the Ottoman Empire. They were fortunate that among the many important people that came to Seattle, one had been a playwright and play director in Istanbul, Leon Bahar, and he replicated his work in Seattle after he served in the Ottoman army, by the way, defending his homeland. And he wrote very patriotic poems about how he loved the, uh, the Ottoman Empire, and then he came to the United States afterward, afterwards. This sense of connection to the Ottoman Empire is really significant um, because you can see this in the artifacts um, of the communities that they brought with them. Here we have a ketubah on the left, a uh, wedding contract, which is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, but if you'll notice in the top center here, 
It's pertained to the Ben Susen, uh, ben Susen family. There is the star and crescent. These are signs of his, uh, symbols of Islam. These were the symbols of the Ottoman Empire that were emblazoned on the Ottoman flag. Think about that. Think about if you are Jewish or Muslim and you're not in the United States and you get married in the United States and you put a cross on the top of your wedding document. I mean, that would be really unusual to say the least, but in the context of the Ottoman Empire, this was a way that Jews were able to express their allegiance and sense of connectivity to the place from which they had come. And on the right, we have the scroll of Esther for the holiday of Purim. And this is from uh, al Dajin, who's with us today. This is a family artifact. And you'll see also on the top, there is once again the crescent, a sign and symbol of the connectivity between the Sephardic Jews and their empire of birth that was transplanted with them to the United States. And we can see that connection even more strongly if we go back to the newspapers in the Ottoman Empire. In the Ottoman Empire, they occasionally reported about what was going on in Seattle. During the context of the Balkan Wars in 1912 and 1913, a Jewish leader from the island of Rhodes initiated a, um, a fundraising campaign it's from the prominent family al Hadef to raise funds to support the Ottoman war effort and to support Jewish refugees who are flocking into Istanbul as a result of the violence. Seattle is where many Jews who originate from Turkey are found and who are always attached to their motherland from which they came. They raised uh, $1,000, as you can see here, which was a considerable amount for the time. And some of the other artifacts that were brought to Seattle, to Seattle. On the right, we have a prayer in Judeo-Spanish, in Ladino, celebrating the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. So you can see, again, this connectivity was real. It was material. It was, um, it was a very important part of the culture. Coming to the United States, that was not necessarily a great thing to advertise, especially in the context of the wars that would engulf the region, being associated with Islam, being associated with Turkey, being associated with the Orient, being associated with Asia, would not do you any favors. And we can see here in the, uh, the Spokesman Review, which was in Spokane, a pretty provocative title here, Balkan Wars and Everything But Bloodshed, Radiating Along Main Avenues in Spokane. The first line is, if you happen to resemble a Turk, believe in his religion, or speak with his accent, keep away. That's how the article begins. This time, they will push the Turk back to Asia. They say, the Turks don't belong in Europe, they don't belong in the West, they are part of Asia. Here it is, two suspicious characters, possibly Turks at a cafe, right? So, uh, and then here it has, this is dangerous only if you happen to resemble a Turk. So you get the sense, right? You get the sense of the vulnerabilities that associations with Turkey might pose for you at this time. And that was only intensified in the context of World War I, where in response to this tension, the Sephardic Jews in Seattle as across the United States, embark upon a, came, a campaign of, we might call it rebranding. They distance themselves from their empire of origin, they distance themselves from Turkey, and they reframe themselves as Spanish Jews. We are not from Turkey, we are from Spain. Which is not, not true, it's true. They were from Spain 500 years before. They recognized that claiming connection to Spain would be a way to connect themselves to Europe, it may be a way to connect themselves to whiteness. It would be a way to, to disentangle themselves from the pigeonhole of being possibly classified as Mongolian, on the one hand, as an enemy alien, because the Ottoman Empire was on the opposite side of the United States during World War I. And it's within this context of World War I that Sephardic Jews begin to plant their institutional roots. And you can see it's no coincidence that the first congregations um, establish themselves on the eve and as World War I begins. A sign that perhaps return is no longer possible, no longer desirable. And here we see a clipping from the Ladino newspaper of the Sephardic Bikor Holim, which was, by the way, established as the uh, Bikor Holim Oriental de Rodosto. Uh, 
Oriental was in the title of the organization, they realized, eh, we're going to, that's not going to be so helpful for us. And so it became the Bikor Cholim Sephardi, the Sephardic or the Spanish Jewish Sephardic Bikor Cholim organization. And here you can see um, the inauguration of that congregation, which is the, became the, uh, the Tulliver uh, Church in, uh, in Seattle, a, a black church, a very important landmark in Seattle, but has, again, the uh, Jewish origin there. And uh, you, the, what the caption says is that R Rabbi Avraham Maimon, the, a prominent rabbi, was there uh, giving a blessing, the Shechah which is a blessing that one gives on special occasions. And that's what it says that he's doing there, and that's what the photo is. So they have now their own organizations, their own synagogues, and they're looking forward to building their life in Seattle. One of the major steps is they begin to go to things like the university. The children, either those who came as children or those who are born in the United States, they advance. They get educated in the American culture. And some go to the University of Washington, including these two youngsters. They were not university students at this time. This is before they were in the university. They were not that precocious, although they were quite, uh, quite active in the intellectual endeavors. And it's very important to recognize that not only did these siblings, Albert Adato and Emma Adato, did they go to the University of Washington, they got their graduate degrees, their master's degrees, studying Sephardic culture. The initiation of Sephardic studies at the national level in the university, a scene in the United States began at two universities only in the United States simultaneously. The University of Washington and the other university you always, I'm sure, associate with the University of Washington, which is Columbia University. Those were the two univer... That was a joke. Thank you. Um, New York City and Seattle, Columbia University and the University of Washington, pioneering the field of Sephardic studies. These are my intellectual antecedents and that in some ways make this whole enterprise um, possible today. But it wasn't always clear, even in the 30s, that Seattle would be home forever. And if we look at the efforts of figures like the founders of the community, like Solomon Calvo and Policar, you can see here that they weren't always so excited about the prospect of leaving home. Solomon Calvo, in uh, the daughter's oral history, Fortuna, talks about how, his, how her mother, the spouse, she didn't want to go. But the culture of the time was you follow the husband. So if he was going to go anywhere in the world, you were going to follow him. And what's fascinating here is that even though Solomon Calvo had been in the United States since 1902. He had gone back to get married in 1906. He doesn't petition to become a citizen of the United States until 1938. So he's been here over 35 years, essentially, not as a citizen, not as a full participant in society. And then you look uh, at the other uh, founder, Jack Policar, and he's moving back and forth quite a lot over the years. He arrives in 1902 or 1903, he returns, he gets married, he has three children born back in the old country, he comes back to the United States solo with the expectation that he would bring his wife, but something inconvenient happens, World War I, and he cannot go back and his wife cannot come. And so he goes back finally, uh, and the whole family comes. He doesn't file for his to become a citizen of the United States until 1940, and he doesn't become a citizen of the United States until 1943. Even Dora Cohen doesn't, become a citizen, doesn't file her petition to become a naturalized citizen until the late 30s. So you're thinking, what is going on? Why are they not, I mean, are they really anticipating that they'll return and they, the United States is not going to be their home forever? I think it's a different dynamic. Some have said, well, they were lazy. Actually, that, that's what that's, the published article to say, that they were lazy. Why were they lazy? Because they're from the Muslim world and they're from the Orient and they, they, they sat in the sun too long and uh, they rather just uh, hang out rather than become actively involved in their rights as citizenship. I don't think that's true at all either. We get a clue in an oral history from Yuda de Leon in which he talks about the problems that Sephardic Jews encountered when they tried to become citizens of the United States. And uh, this is an oral history that uh, uh, Howard Bihar, I think, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, <laughs> that uh, Howard Joker undertook 
uh, quite a number of years ago, who wrote the foundational study of the history of Jews in Washington State. And here he talks about um, the naturalization judge here in Seattle. The natural j- naturalization judge in Seattle was notorious at the national level for denying people who he didn't think were white enough to become citizens of the United States. He was very involved in denying South Asians their petitions for naturalization. He was very involved in denying Armenians their petitions to naturalization. And it seems that he was also involved in presenting difficulties for Sephardic Jews in their efforts to become naturalized. And he says, I want to tell you one thing. The very mean judge that SOB, pardon us all, Judge Smith, during his citizenship exam, in which he felt so insulted that he nearly assaulted him, he says, you've been the cause for a lot of our Sephardic Jews in the city of Seattle from becoming citizens of America. I said, many of those men are good citizens. They raise nice families. They have never committed any crimes. They've lived as law-abiding citizens. I said, every time they come here, you scare them. You do everything to keep them from citizenship. And I think this helps us explain why It's not until the 1930s that you see the Sephardic Jews in Seattle becoming naturalized citizens in greater numbers. Why? Because he eventually retired and died in 1932. And he was an infamous nativist. He was part of the broader culture of the time. And he was very in favor of understanding the United States as a white Christian and specifically Protestant country. And he speaks about it in his writings, in his op-eds, in I found correspondence that he writes to his sister where he talks about all of that. Um, And I think that this helps us understand some of the challenges that Sephardic Jews may have encountered coming to the United States. I want to include with one final story. And the final story has to deal with the tale of a young woman whose daughter is also with us here today. Um, And this is the tale of Clara Barkey, who was a young woman born on the island of Rhodes. And there is a fascinating book um, put together by the daughter, Cynthia, A Hug from Afar, and I'd encourage all of you to take a look at it. Clara Barkey, as a nine-year-old young woman on the island of Rhodes, then Italian, part of the Italian empire, began a correspondence with her carissimo tio Raphael Capaluto, her dear uncle Raphael Capaluto, who was in the uh, business of Perdez in the curtain industry, which he began in New York. Again, came to New York, then came to Seattle. And she begins a correspondence with her uh, relatives here in Seattle. And it's a very dramatic tale. The short of it is that through this correspondence that she had initiated, she was able to help rescue her family and help them escape the island of Rhodes on the eve of World War II. And it is only through that intervention that she and her family were spared the fate of all the other Jews of the island of Rhodes, like most of the other Jews in the region, in, uh, in the Balkans, who were deported and murdered at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The Barkey family instead wound up finding refuge in Tangier, which was one of the only cities in the world that was open. It was an international city, and it was one of the only cities that was open to Jewish refugees at the time. The family spends several the war years in the, uh, in the refugee settlement in Tangier and eventually is able to secure visas for everybody except for the father because the father had been a Turkish national. The other members of the family were Italian nationals, so they were the quotas for Italians were higher than it was for Turks, so they were able to come to the United States, and the father followed several years later. But what's fascinating here is on the Ellis Island Ship Manifesto, you can see something fascinating here. Matilda, the family, Barky Capaluto, Capaluto Barky, under the category of nationality, it says Italian, and under the category of race, it says Hebrew, that's slash scratched out. And does anybody see what's written on top? White. So with the stroke of a pen, the status and fate of Sephardic Jews was transformed. It was a bureaucratic act, an administrative act that would then set up the possibilities and set up the future for the post-war generation of Jews in general and Sephardic Jews in particular of more readily, although with some challenges, entering into 
white American society, including right here in Seattle. And that is another chapter for another time. But I hope that what I've been able to share with you is a little bit about the origins, the opportunities and challenges of Sephardic Jews in Seattle in the first part of the 20th century. Thank you for your attention. We're going to do an audience Q&A here. I'm going to grab a mic, and if you could raise your hands, I'll bring the mic around to you, and you can ask your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? Yes, please raise your hands. I see you in the green up here. Well, this is off topic, I guess. I know you're talking about Seattle, and everyone here is probably interested in that. I just wondered, what happened to Portland, and why did that not become a, a focus and a draw? Well, it didn't not. <laughs> it, it did. It did. And in some ways, Portland is a, an offshoot of the Seattle Sephardic community. And uh, there is a Sephardic community in, C in, in Portland, and there are many family and other kinds of connections um, between the communities. It was a smaller community, um, and it was a community that was uh, composed, uh, comprised of families of similar background and similar uh, dynamics. People moved between, we have in our Sephardic Studies collection, correspondence, for example, from the Shamaria family, that moved between Seattle and Portland, and you get a sense of what their lives were like. Even in the Ladino newspapers in New York, occasionally they would report, uh, they would have a report about a delegation went from Seattle to Portland, or, or vice versa, or they went from Seattle to Portland, and if you can believe it, they went all the way to Los Angeles, and they talk about everything that they saw along the way. So Portland is a part of the story, um, and I think we can think of it as a kind of a S Seattle satellite. Uh, in terms of the Sephardic world, at least. See someone in pink. I have a question about the Industrial Removal Office, mm -hmm. which I'd never heard of before. Yeah. So even though it sounds negative, i.e. removal, is it possible that it instead was just a way to spread Jews throughout the country and maybe be a positive influence? I didn't mean to v impute value judgment to the, the term, but I, I yeah, I, they didn't think of it as a negative. They thought that they were doing a service, the organizers of that. I mean, these were more well-to-do, integrated Jews who had been living in the United States, they or their families, for several generations. So they were trying to provide these folks with opportunities and to deal with the congestion of the, of the city in a certain sense. So the, there were concerns about economics. There were concerns about health. You know, you live in a tenement building on the Lower East Side with, uh, you know, 40 of your closest relatives in a one-bedroom place. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but not so much. Um, you know, or living as a boarder or a lodger in that context was not an ideal scenario. And so they worked actively. They, I think they, they removed or they, they, they relocated, I think what we probably say now it would be a better, they helped to relocate tens of thousands of Jews. I think maybe 80,000 at least. hundred. Uh, I don't want to give you a number now. But th tens of thousands, tens of thousands of Jews they relocated. I found files for about 150 um, Jews from Turkey who had been uh, relocated, uh, a couple of dozen from to Seattle. All right, we have a couple of questions from our live stream audience. Uh, the first one is, uh, earlier in your talk, you were talking about uh, a time which would have been during where there was an international PR slash fundraising campaign about what was happening to the Armenians. Mm -hmm. um, and where did Jewish-Turkish communities fall along this? 
That's a great question, and it's a challenging question, and it's actually a question that the PhD student I mentioned earlier, Oya Akhtash, is working on in her dissertation. Um, now, there are a couple of ways to address that question. The first one is, uh, I mentioned Albert Adato, who had written his thesis in the 1930s at the University of Washington. And he has a number of very intriguing appendices in that thesis, one of which is interviews with Sephardic Jews about their attitudes and impressions about the fate of Armenians uh, in the 1890s. And so the, the Armenian genocide really took place in 1915 during World War I, but there was an antecedent of mass violence against Armenians in the 1890s. And if you read these testimonies of Jews from Istanbul who s observed what was going on and had come to Seattle, you see a conflicting picture. On the one hand, you have a general sense among these Ottoman Jews that what the Ottoman state was doing, the massacring of Armenians, was not right. It was not right. From the other perspective, you have a number of these people testifying in the oral histories that are recorded there that they opposed the efforts of the Armenians to advocate for their own independence. Now, um, they thought that they shouldn't have been doing that, but they didn't think they deserved to be killed for it. The third piece that's really interesting in these oral testimonies that comes out is one account in which a, a, an Ottoman Jew from Istanbul talks about how he tried to s intervene to protect his Armenian neighbors. How did they do so? They gave their Armenian friends Jewish prayer shawls, uh, kipot, uh, yarmulkes, and Hebrew prayer books, and told them when the Ottoman forces come by to shout out, Yehudi, Yehudi, Jewish, Jewish, and in this way, they survived, and this may be one of the only times in history where somebody decided to dress up like Jews in order to not be persecuted. <laughs> but it, 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 it worked. It is a really fascinating phenomenon. I also heard, somebody told me in the Sephardic community here that he had heard, and I don't have any other evidence other than this, what this person told me, was that one of the reasons why the uh, Jews from Turkey, what became Turkey, and the Jews from Rhodes retained a division was over dispute about the Ottoman state's treatment of the Armenians. I don't know if that's true, but that is something that had been told to me, and it's, if anybody has any more information actually on that question or any of the other things that I have referred to, I would be very interested in learning more. Thank you, uh, because the next question actually was someone asking to, dis to explain the differences between the two major Sephardic synagogues from Rhodes and Turkey, and also how those two different groups ended up here. Right, well, um, the, the initially, well, as you, let me try again. If we go back here, way back here, If we go back here, you can see the places from which the Sephardic Jews are described as coming from. This is in 1912. The island of Marmara, they were called Marmaralis. The town of Rodosto or Tekirda, they were called Tekirdalis. And then there were people from the island of Rhodes, Rodizlis. And then people from Istanbul, Constantinople, from Salonika, and from Izmir. So there were a, a wide variety of geographical origins of towns and places of origin from which the Sephardic Jews came to Seattle. But the, um, the community would really be marked by two or three of these subgroups that left their institutional imprint in the city. The Tekir Dalis and the Marmar Alis would become the Turkish congregation. They each had their own synagogues initially and eventually they merged into one. The Rodizlis, uh, preserve their own congregation, and that congregation still stands today. So the, the, the Turkish congregation uh, is uh, the Sephardic Bikor Halim, and the Rodizli congregation is congregation Ezra Besarot. And um, they have slightly different customs and practices, slightly different pronunciation of Ladino, different sub-dialects, which is not to, be surpri not to be surprised, I mean, probably maybe if you're listening to how I speak, you might infer that I'm not from Seattle based on my own pronunciation, and it was no different in the different regions 
of the Ottoman Empire, Sephardic Jews spoke in slightly different ways. In the South, they speak one way. In the Pacific Northwest, in, in London, they speak a different way. So it's, it's uh, no different uh, in this context. So there were slightly different pronunciations of Ladino, slightly different cultures. Um, and uh, they were able to congeal into these two kinds of um, communities. In large part, I think it's demographics that the smaller groups from Istanbul or Izmir, there were also groups from Gallipoli, like the, the battle during World War I from the town of Monastir or Bitola in what is now northern Macedonia. They did not have enough demographic uh, weight to justify the formation of their own uh, organizations. And so they merged and mixed with the other groups. And from the 1920s, there was a heated, heated, there was a discussion, a debate that was surfaced in the Ladino newspapers in New York about um, what was called at the time amalgamation or merger. Why do we need to have uh, multiple kinds of communities? Shouldn't we have one united community? And that is a debate that continues 100 years later. Any other questions? Don't be shy. Uh, this might be a personal question for me, but Dora Cohen is my grandmother as well. Okay. The rose water you have? Yeah. Was that in my environment all my life and I didn't know about it? I don't know. You'd have to ask Doreen. <laughs> I always ask Doreen. She knows all this stuff, and I, where was I? I <laughs> well, you can come to my office. <laughs> I saw another hand up here. I speak some Portuguese, I don't speak Spanish, but when you read the poem at the beginning, mm -hmm. I could almost understand mm -hmm. the entire mm -hmm. poem. Yeah. Why? Great question. This has to do with how Ladino was formed. And there is some debate among linguistics and scholars about the origin of Ladino. So some will say that Ladino is a language that had existed in medieval Spain. But the Ladino that was spoken in the Ottoman Empire, or it was called also Judeo-Spanish, or Judesmo, meaning the Jewish language, uh, the, the sort of the understanding of how that language formed was when Jews left the different provinces of the Iberian Peninsula, the different kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula from which they were living, and they resettled in the Ottoman Empire. So you might have people coming from Aragon, from Castilla, and those who went from those places to Portugal, then going to Istanbul, they didn't know each other, and they were speaking kind of like a Jewish variety of the local language. Those were all kind of mixed together. So the base of Judeo-Spanish as it developed into the 20th century was Castilian Spanish. But there are influences from Portuguese, like they say fazer in some dialects, or favlar in some, which is, that's the Portuguese influence on it instead of avlar or aser or azer. Um, <clears throat> And those, uh, those regional languages of the Iberian Peninsula became fused together, and they were fused together along with Hebrew and Aramaic, Arabic, and then the languages of the environment of the Eastern Mediterranean, principally Turkish and Greek, um, but also languages like Italian and French, which were languages of prestige. So like that's why, is anybody here Sephardic, by the way, or of Sephardic background? quite a few people. Does anybody know the term nona? Yeah. Did anybody have a nona or has a nona? Is anybody a nona? <clears throat> nona is the Italian word for grandmother, but it is also a Ladino word for grandmother. And I remember in elementary school, I had a friend who was Italian, and uh, we both discovered that we called our grandparents nono and nona, and he said, well, this must be because you're Italian. And I said, I didn't know I was Italian. <laughs> and I'm not. But that has to do with the, lingu the linguistic fusion that produced Ladino. There was a scholar at, during World War I who said that Ladino was like the Mediterranean Esperanto, an organic Esperanto that had all the influences of all the neighboring languages. Um, I hope that addresses your question. Hi. Um, I had a question about um, kind of the rebranding um, that you were talking about to kind of reclaiming the Spanish identity. Um, after citizenship laws changed and after kind of time removed from World War I, was there ever kind of a, a moment of reclaiming the Ottoman and Turkish identity? 
Well, I, I don't think that the, it's a great question. I don't think that the Ottoman or Turkish identity ever went away, but I think in terms of how it was more publicly expressed, I think maybe I, I can give you, I tried to bring a couple of extra slides in anticipation of some questions. Let's see if I can find one. Uh, here. This is, um, I don't know if anybody went there to the Thatcher's uh, Cafe Pike Place Market. This was a Turkish cafe, a Turkish restaurant in Pike Place Market. And if you see here, but it was established in the 50s. So it's after the war. And the 50s is important because what is happening in the 1950s is the Cold War. And what is also happening in the 1950s is that the U.S. government is pouring a lot of funds into Greece and Turkey to try to prevent communism from entering into the zone. And so there was a moment in which saying that you were Turkish didn't mean you were the enemy. You know, and, that, that, and so there was a way to reclaim it. I even have fascinating documentation from some Jews who are from the island of Rhodes, which became Italian. And during World War II, Italy was on the opposing side. And, you know, I, we know about Japanese internment, but there were also some several thousand Italian nationals that were rounded up as well. And so we have some of these very clever, cleverly thinking. They said, Italian? What do you mean? I'm not Italian. I'm Turkish. And so they would reclaim their Turkish identity in that context to, again, evade detrimental consequences. And here you have a real, I mean, this is a real Turkish cafe. I mean, look at the, the advertising here, the image that is being projected here. It says Turkey. Here's the Turkish flag. Here's Turkey. You know, um, uh, all of the cuisines are prepared in the Ottoman style, including the general Turkish style, but also the Sephardic style. And here I think you have the, the owner, uh, Thatcher, he's wearing his Ottoman uh, military uniform. Um, and so uh, I don't think that the Turkish component ever completely disappeared, but in terms of a public representation of a kind of a outside identity, we'll say became, you know, it was more advantageous to say that you were, or le less detrimental to say that you were Greek, to say that you were Spanish, to say that you were Italian. Um, and it also became, I think, you know, speaking to people, you know, it's hard to explain to somebody who doesn't know what is a Sephardic Jew. You have to sort of tell a story. It doesn't just fit into a tiny box. So eh, shorthand, you say, I don't want to give you the whole thing. So I just say, I'm Spanish. My family's from Spain, which is not false. But then you have to say, well, why are you, but I'm from the Ottoman Empire, but I speak but my family spoke a language that's like Spanish, but they wrote it in Hebrew. I mean, it becomes, and but I have a name that's Arabic. I mean, you know, or it becomes a lot. It becomes a lot to try to do that. Um, you know, and the Spanish piece became even more elevated in recent years because, as you may know, uh, the Spanish government enacted a law a number of years ago that provided the opportunity for the descendants of Sephardic Jew, Jews to take uh, to claim Spanish citizenship. And we have the first one who did so is also in our presence here, which is Doreen in the United States here, Doreen Al-Hadef. Al um, and so this became a new opportunity for a re-exploration of all the aspects of Sephardic identity, I think, and a, a, a sort of contributed to a kind of a reawakening, and especially the question of Sephardic Jews as it relates to Spain. One thing I didn't say is why are Sephardic Jews called Sephardic Jews? Sepharad is a Hebrew word that is used to describe the Iberian Peninsula historically. So that's why they're called Sephardic Jews. Hi, I was wondering if there was prejudice or disassociation that happened between the Jewish who, who came from uh, Western Europe or Eastern Europe and the Sephardic community and whether those, there were tensions between them or not. Yes. <laughs> The, 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 in that early generation, the people who first came, I mean, first there was that tale I mentioned of the non-recognition of the Sephardic Jews as Jews by fellow Jews. You know, you could be Italian or you could be Greek. Are you Turkish? Maybe you're, you're I don't know, Arab. I don't know anything but, but Jewish. And those dynamics would continue to play out for some time. I, I, there was a very fascinating op-ed in the Jewish transcript uh, 
which was the Jewish newspaper that operated here for quite a long time in the 1920s, discussing this question. And they say, we, the Jewish community, we know we have Sephardic Jews among us, but we don't necessarily consider them part of the community. And this was an, uh, an editorial saying, well, we should, we should. And what they admit is that, um, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase it, but they said that we've internalized American modes of snobbery. This is how they say it, which is, you know, the West is better than the rest kind of a thing, and white is better than everybody else. And then what they go on to say is that we have to recognize that as much as we see ourselves as European Jews part of the American mainstream, and we'd like to see ourselves maybe as white, that's not what the race scientists say. You know, the race scientists say that we're not white. The race scientists say that we don't belong. So if we recognize that, maybe at least we can make room for these other Jews to be part of our community. Now, that rhetoric would change. This is 1920s, remember. So we have several generations to traverse until we get till today. But essentially for the American-born generation, the practices of the older generation were defunct. In other words, it was considered a blasphemy, essentially, for an Ashkenazi Jew and a Sephardic Jew to marry in the early days. It was considered outrageous for a Jew from Rhodes and a Jew from Marmara to get married, let alone a Sephardic Jew and an Ashkenazi Jew, but especially for the American-born generation, for the generation that served in World War II during the war, who was educated in American schools. You know, Jewish was increasingly understood as Jewish, and while some of those prejudices and concerns continued and continue today, um, the, the boundaries between the communities in terms of uh, creating families across Sephardic Ashkenazi divide were uh, diminished incredibly. I'd be curious, anybody is of Sephardic background? Here, can I get a raise of hands again? Is anybody of Sephardic background and also Ashkenazi background? Some of us, but not all of us, right? So you get a sense of the way in which if we were dealing with two generations ago, there would have been no hands up. And I think that that helps us understand the, the dynamics. All right. We have uh, one closing question, I think that would be good from the live stream, which is, do you have any book slash lecture Etc. recommendations on Jewish his history in Washington State or on Sephardic Jews in Seattle for people who are so inspired that they want to learn more. Yeah, well, I think the, 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 the book for Washington State, Jews in Washington State, is Howard's, Howard's book with uh, Family of Strangers. That's the title. They just issued a new edition, and you can readily get it, and I would highly recommend it. And it gives the whole history of, uh, of Jewish life in Seattle from the arrival of, and, and Washington State from the 19th century um, and with a new uh, new chapter that brings the story up until today. So that would be the first go-to source, I would say. Um, there is a, uh, well, there are two books that you're going to be able to buy afterwards, which I would recommend that you purchase. <clears throat> um, uh, one of which is a collection of essays um, called Sephardic Trajectories that deals with Sephardic Jews in general and especially their imprint and role in Seattle, of which I contributed one of the, uh, one of the essays in which one of my former PhD students uh, served as the co-editor. Um, and um, there is another book that is probably worth checking out, which is called Sephardic Jews in America, and that gives sort of an overview. It's very New York-centered. Um, but it gives a sort of an overview of Sephardic history uh, in the United States. The other piece that I should mention when we talk about Sephardic Jews, and some of you may be aware of this, is the first Jews to come to what became the United States during the colonial times were also Sephardic Jews. These were Spanish and Portuguese Jews that came from, from Spain to Portugal and then from Portugal to the American colonies in the 16th and 17th century. Many of them came as conversos, as Jewish converts to Christianity. What's fascinating about that dynamic, talk about intra-Jewish prejudice, it's also in this story as well, when the Spanish and Portuguese Jews observed that there were Jews coming from uh, 
uh, the Ottoman Empire to the United States who wanted to call themselves Sephardic Jews, the first group that said these newcomers should not be called Sephardic Jews were the old established Sephardic Jews who didn't want to be associated with the newcomers. And so they said they can call themselves whatever they want, <laughs> Just don't, call, don't take the name Sephardic Jews. You're going to sully our reputation as the grandees of the American Jewish community. So they preferred terms like Oriental Jews or Levantine Jews, which placed them essentially outside of the European context and was an attempt to disconnect them from those Spanish origins and link them into the Eastern Mediterranean, into the Muslim world. Um, and so that was again one of the dynamics that was at play and uh, this book by Aviva Ben Or, Sephardic Jews in America, gets, uh, gets into that. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much for the opportunity. Merci mucho. Oh, Thank you again. One more round of applause, please. A couple notes before we get to the book signing. I'd like to thank our partners at History Link. Yay, Jennifer Ott here is with us in the audience. Um, and we want to plug next month's History Cafe if you'd like to come back. It will be on May 17th, and it will be a conversation between Eric Wagner and journalist Sandy Doughton, and it's called Tales from the Mountain, and it'll be about Mount St. Helens and ecological repair. Um, and if you'd like to help us provide the best and continue growing our public programming, uh, telling important stories of community, it would really help us out if you could please take our survey in the back. You'll be entered in a raffle. So, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you again, Professor Nara. This was so amazing. If I, could just, if I could add one other thing on your way home. I mean, stay, first of all, and get a book. I'll sign it. But on your way home at 8 o'clock, there will actually be a story on... KUOW about the Sephardic Jews of Seattle. So you can check that out or you can look at it online as well. NPR. Yeah, that's, that's NPR.